before John Paul II died. Whoa. Is that what we want? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it, was the, uh, it was the Easter, I think, before he died. And uh, he usually would do a um, Good Friday uh, Stations of the Cross in the Colosseum. And that was the tradition that the popes would do. Um, but he was too infirm at that point. Uh, uh, and um, so he was sitting someplace uh, uh, watching it as they were, um, as someone else was leading the Stations of the Cross. But they had him live from this room wherever he was watching it. So it was this weird thing like, He's watching himself, watching himself. It's like this bizarre thing. So that's what I feel like today. That I'm, except that right now I'm not on the screen. Okay. Are we now live, Kelsey? Okay, we are live. Uh, and we're going to be, we're now live on Facebook. And uh, you are, uh, can, can you all see me, Abby? Welcome, Abby. Yeah. Um, we can't see, can't the see, can't rest see you. The yeah, we can't see the rest of the folks for some reason here, including me, I guess. Right. Um, there you go. See you now. Oh, there I am. Oh, yep. I disappeared again. <laughs> <laughs> You're there. You're there. Felicia's not. <laughs> Okay, for some reason we have a different kind of a view here, right? Um, there we are, all right, excellent. So good to see uh, Vanessa and Barbara. Good to see you, Barbara, haven't seen you in a while. Felicia, Gloria, Abby, good morning, everybody. Barbara, it reminds me of our old days back uh, when we all were doing this only on Zoom to see you this morning. So we're glad to, glad to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Uh, and then all of our folks here um, live at St. John's. Um, well, today we're going to be uh, using uh, primarily a PowerPoint to go through a lot of this stuff. So um, we're, we're talking today about, um, we're going to go beyond the book of Samuel to uh, where are some of the other places that we see David casting his shadow throughout the Bible? Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've had several really rich weeks so far with some wonderful presenters talking about various aspects of the book of Samuel and how David appears within that narrative um, that, that focuses primarily on him, although, of course, it talks about the prophet Samuel and talks about King Saul, and, uh, but, but it focuses primarily on David and his reign. Um, and then really the whole second half of the book is about sort of the decline of David, really, um, that sort of has its uh, beginning uh, with the, the situation with Bathsheba um, and, um, and then goes downhill from there. Um, but um, <clears throat> today we're going to look at how, how important David and the, the united monarchy um, are for the formation of the whole Bible as well. So if we could move to the PowerPoint, if that's possible, please, Kelsey. Um, so again, we're talking about, uh, <clears throat> we're calling this in the shadow of David reading beyond Samuel. In a second, we're gonna go to our uh, slideshow view. There we are. Um, and we can move on to the next, uh, Next slide. So um, David's legacy or his shadow, as we're calling it for our for our purposes here, um, extends throughout uh, a lot of the Bible. Really, uh, we can see references to David in the prophets and many other places. But today we're going to focus on uh, three. The first one of which might be relatively surprising, but but a couple of our presenters have already talked about that. How uh, David. Um, influence or the monarchy's influence appears in the traditions that come to us finally in the book of Genesis. And then uh, we're going to take a look at Psalms. That's not surprising because David has been associated with the Psalms um, very early on. Uh, and then we're going to uh, conclude with a look in particular at the gospel of Matthew, which is the one gospel that is most 
um, interested in Jesus being connected to David. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Um, so let's talk about Genesis, first of all. How, how could we ever think that something that happened, you know, a long time before David um, would have any influence, um, how David would have any influence on that? Well, it has to do with the traditions that come about that are all woven together that wind it, their way up finally in the book of Genesis. Recall, if you will, that the Torah and most of the, in fact, maybe most even of the, of the Hebrew Bible, um, was finally edited into the form that we have it now uh, in the period of the exile and just after the period of the exile. But it isn't as if the, the writers just um, came up with that out of thin air, right? It, it was, it, they, they took traditions that already were existing and wove them together. We talked a little bit about this last week with Aaron Darby, who was talking about excavating the text of the scripture to um, find the various strands of tradition that we can see there. Um, and then, uh, but in, in the book of Genesis and in the Torah in particular, um, you, you I, I think she may have mentioned this, there, there are at least um, uh, four traditions that find their way into the book of Genesis. One is called J, um, which is the Yahwist because that tradition seems to use the word Yahweh whenever they're talking about God. Um, D, the Deuteronomist, and the Deuteronomist is the, is the guy that says, um, uh, what we know is this, that if we follow the law, we will be blessed. If we don't follow the law, we will not be blessed. And so, so uh, uses that image throughout. And that actually is the same author that we believe um, is behind the traditions uh, of the books of Samuel and Kings as well. Um, so there's J, D, E, the Elohist, that, that's a tradition that uses the word L for God, um, and P is the priestly source, um, the, and, and their primary interest is um, in uh, the cult, that is the, the, the worship of Yahweh, and in uh, emphasizing the Sabbath. For example, the second chapter of the book of Genesis is probably written by the priestly source. Uh, I'm sorry, the first chapter of the book of Genesis is written by the priestly source because it, it's one of its emphases is on Sabbath rest, right? So um, that's, so all of these, uh, the, the point of this is that all of these different sources that exist were woven together in a later period to bring us the book of Genesis that we have in our Bibles today. Um, again, it did not sort of like fall um, full blown out of heaven in the King James Version. Uh, but but rather had had uh, many many centuries of of uh, composition before we get it to the way we have it now, and much of Genesis may have been written in the period of the United Monarchy under David and Solomon, um, and if that's the case, what would the purpose of the writer be? Now to understand that, we're going to take a little historical detour. Next slide someplace where you probably would never imagine. We're going to go to ancient Rome, um, where I always like to go. Uh, <laughs> um, and <clears throat> uh, if you see the little picture on the left-hand side there, you have uh, the guy on the right there is Aeneas, or I'm sorry, Virgil, uh, talking about Aeneas, the Aeneid, uh, to the emperor Augustus. Uh, and his wife and uh, <clears throat> their son. So the great, uh, or um, her son, actually. But anyway, that's, that's too much Roman history for us right now. Uh, what we need to do is look at the, the text now. Uh, the great Roman uh, poet Virgil began writing his national uh, epic, the Aeneid, someplace around 30 years before Christ, before the common era. Um, and, and he writes as, as if it's a sequel to Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Um, it, it opens on the burning of Troy and, uh, and Aeneas is escaping the city with his family. Um, and uh, Virgil tells us uh, as part of this whole story that um, the descendants of Aeneas are Romulus and Remus, who are the historical founders of Rome. 
and uh, well, not historical. They're, they're the myth mythical founders of Rome. Uh, we don't really know. Probably there was never such a person as Romulus and Remus, but, but it's the mythical story um, of, of the founding of Rome. And uh, they're descended from Aeneas. And that Rome is seen as the reborn Troy. Now, by the way, we live down the street from someplace that keeps alive the image of Troy and the Aeneid. Um, uh, called the University of Southern California. That, uh, that, that's, uh, that's sort of, uh, <laughs> I remember when, when uh, the, the former president was inaugurated, his whole inaugural address was all about um, uh, the new Troy and, uh, and using quotes from the Aeneid to talk about USC of all things. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, Aeneas, uh, his father also describes their future descendants. He, he constructs sort of a genealogy of the future um, about who will inherit their name. And that includes Augustus Caesar as a descendant of Romulus and Remus. Okay, so you, you might know where, where we're going there. And, and by the way, uh, they, they also have divine blood in their bloodline uh, on uh, Venus on their mother's side and Mars on their father's side. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. And, and, and stick with me here, we're, 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 there's, we're getting a point about why we're talking about this. Um, so what was Virgil's purpose? All right. um, uh, Octavian or, or uh, uh, Gaius Julius Octavianus, uh, shortened form as Octavian, um, was given the title of Augustus. So Augustus isn't a name, it's actually a title given to him by the Senate when he took on the imperial um, throne uh, in about 27 uh, before the common era and he reigned until the year 14 uh, AD or the common era. And he took the throne in a period of political instability. Um, if you recall your history, you would know that, uh, you would remember that um, on the 15th of March in the year 44, um, Caesar is murdered in the Senate because he tries to usurp power from the Republic and to create a, um, um, uh, to become himself the empire or the emperor. And uh, there's a period of instability that follows that. There's, there follows a triumvirate of leaders in Rome, uh, the most famous of which is Mark Antony, who has this little dalliance with this woman down in Egypt by the name of Cleopatra. Um, and then uh, one, one of, uh, the, the triumvirate is exiled to, uh, to Gaul. Um, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra um, are uh, killed in a joint suicide pact after the Battle of Actium uh, in 31, I believe it is. And then um, that leaves only one man standing and that is Octavian uh, who uh, usurps the, the power of Rome. And so he's effectively ending the Republic. So this is a, this is a big deal to um, have a whole different change of government from being uh, a republic that is ruled primarily by the Senate to uh, a empire ruled by a single dictator um, or emperor, if you will. Um, and during his reign, he's, he's thought to be one of the greatest uh, empire builders uh, brought in the era known as the Pax Romana, whether or not there was actually peace uh, but, or was it peace through warfare? But anyway, um, that's neither here nor there either. But Virgil's epic poem gave Augustus a larger than life status, claiming he was not just an upstart usurper, but really he was the one who was destined to be the ruler of Rome, um, the legitimate divine heir to the ancient dynasty of Rome's founders. So uh, next slide, please, Kelsey. So now what does that all have to do with Genesis, right? Okay. Um, and at any point, if you have a, if you have a question, um, I'm gonna ask if somebody, uh, Felicia, would you, uh, would be the, the, uh, the microphone bearer when we, uh, if people have questions, if, uh, thank you so much. Um, so uh, we have here on the left, a quote from the 49th chapter of Genesis, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, the scepter shall not pass from Judah. Um, so similarly, do you remember the context of David's rise to power, right? Formally, they were a tribal society. Uh, they had no centralized monarchy. Um, one of the problems with having a tribal society is that when you have a very well-organized um, uh, nation state with a king, 
uh, on your coast by the name of uh, the Phoenicians. Uh, you're going you're gonna to be taking notice of that, and you're going to be um, wondering how long it's going to be before they pick you off one at a time. Um, so, so it was in their interest to develop uh, a move from a tribal state to um, a kingdom or a monarchy. Um, so there's a king now and not tribal chieftains. Now also, uh, the first king, if you recall from the first book of Samuel, is who? It's Saul, right? Not David. Um, and so David takes the crown from Saul. So already we have here, okay, first of all, we don't like the monarchy because, uh, you know, we used to be a tribal society and there's sort of some problems with that, both theologically and also in terms of power bases. Um, and okay, now that we have a king, uh, now all of a sudden you're saying that, that the king that we had isn't the right king, but we have this other king. So um, how, do, how do we justify that? So David sets up a central capital as well, instead of having all these little chieftains uh, and little tribal areas, um, you now have a central city, Jerusalem. That was, and what's really smart about that, as we might recall, is that it was not a, it didn't belong to anybody. It was a Jebusite city. And so when it's taken over by David, it, it becomes a new thing. It's sort of like Washington, D.C. I think maybe a couple of our folks in the past couple of weeks have already mentioned that. Um, it doesn't belong to anybody. And then he sets up a temple also in Jerusalem. Remember, before this, there was no temple. The, 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 um, the uh, Ark of the Covenant moved around with people, and, and God's presence was in a tent, not in a, in a building, right? So that's something new also. So we have a, a king. We have an usurper king, we have a city that we didn't have before, and we have a temple uh, under Solomon. But, but, uh, but, but we have this sort of real transition time going on. So the book of Genesis may serve a similar purpose to the Aeneid, in that it grounds David's authority in the ancient traditions of Israel, and it helps to create a new identity in a shared epic story. So in the same way that now we have one capital city, we have one temple, now we, all of our tribes, have this one central story to remind us of where we came from and how united we all are. Um, and it goes all the way back to, to Father Abraham. Um, so how does Genesis support the new nation? Well, we're going to give some examples. Um, and uh, so it's a story about the past, but it reflects um, the present, right? So I think we have a question coming up here. Make sure you turn, turn the mic on there, Felicia. There we go. Uh, my question is... Could you remove your mask to ask your question? Thank you. My question is um, that Genesis is marrying, mirroring the Aeneid at this point. Which was written first? In terms of um, the Aeneid? Or the, yeah, the yeah. Aeneid versus the book of Genesis. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Genesis is clearly older uh, because if we're talking about many of the, the sources that made up the book of Genesis um, stemming from the time of the monarchy, we're talking about um, probably the 900s, like just after David, Right. Um, in terms of those sources. The, the final product probably um, was put together probably in the 500s before Christ. So we're talking hundreds of years. Uh, the Aeneid, as we just saw, was, was begun to be written in, in around the year 30 BC, right, or BCE, uh, so much later than the... So maybe the, the Aeneid was mirroring Genesis. Ah, that could be. Um, I doubt it because I, I'm not sure that, that Virgil would have known that that particular text, to, you know, it wouldn't have been in his worldview probably, because remember, he's high and mighty in Rome, and they think they know everything, right? So they, <laughs> but it could be possible, because, you know, what we're talking about here, what, what we have to see in, in our Bible is um, one of the great epic stories of um, Western culture. Uh, and um, as, as Professor Alter said a few weeks ago, um, the kinds of characters that we have in the Samuel stories, for example, are uh, much more well-developed uh, than, than um, than the Iliad and the Odyssey. You know, Odysseus, is, as Professor um, Alter said to us, um, really doesn't change much. He's the same guy from the beginning to the end, even though you know, we're talking about lots and lots of years. Um, but David 
we see a whole development of his character from a youth to a, a very old man, and then finally to his own death in, in uh, the book of Kings. Professor Alter would actually say that the first and second chapters of Kings probably are part of the Samuel cycle rather than the Kings cycle. But anyway, that's neither here nor there either. But um, yeah, so, so, so it doesn't mean that, that these stories are not wonderful pieces of literature as well as scripture for us. Um, but, but I'm not sure that Aeneas would have had, um, or Virgil would have had, uh, had that in his arsenal. He's probably thinking more of trying to recreate the, the, um, the power of the Iliad and the Odyssey because it's not written in prose either, it's written in poetry uh, in the same way that the Iliad and the Odyssey would be. But, but that's a good point. You know, you know, um, he might've got the idea from there, who knows, you know, right? When we don't, a lot of this stuff, it's all conjecture, right? I think Jim has a question also, please, yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering if um, the story of Romulus and Remus, does it um, have any linkages to the story of Abel and Cain? Ah, well, you know, um, it does. Uh, I don't think that it's a, I, I don't think that it, it has a direct um, literary connection, right? Uh, but they definitely are. And, and, it, and in, um, in my book, Traveling Home, I have a whole section on that, um, on how the founding of Rome and how the how empire um, uh, valorizes or makes a virtue out of uh, the killing of the weaker. Whereas the Bible in Cain and Abel has an exact opposite story to tell, right? So um, I, again, I don't think there's any, uh, any historical literary connection to those two, but there definitely is a connection to the two of them, right? Um, okay, let's go on if we can. Um, so, oh, oh, no, go back, go back, go back. There we go. Um, let's look at some examples again then, right? So, um, so in the 17th chapter of Genesis, that's where we get Abram becoming Abraham and Sarai becoming Sarah. They're given their new names. Um, but Abraham and God says to Abraham and Sarah in two different places, right? Once to Abraham, once to Sarah, that, that kings shall come forth from you. Now, Remember, there's no monarchy at all, that, and monarchy is not even envisioned. And in fact, monarchy is not even desirable um, before the time of, of uh, Saul and David and, and Solomon. So um, the fact that in the mouth of Abraham, there's a prediction of monarchy, right? That's, uh, that's, that's you know, makes us wonder whether, where was, when was this book written, right? Uh, and then... Um, there are boundaries of the promised land promised to Abraham in Genesis 15, 18, where God says, um, or, or where, the, where the text says, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, Abraham rather, or I'm sorry, Abram saying, because he's still Abram in 15, he becomes Abraham in chapter 17. Um, to your seed, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Well, these are the boundaries of the kingdom under David and Solomon. And it only then, uh, because once uh, Solomon dies, um, all bets are off. The, the kingdom divides between, uh, between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah, the other king, uh, nations in the, in the north, uh, Judah in the south. Uh, so the only time in the history of Israel um, when we have this uh, extent is during the time of uh, David and Solomon, um, and you can pretty much map the actual extent of the kingdom to this here. So if we um, go to the next slide, you can see the, the image of that. So if you look on the map, um, this is um, uh, Solomon's kingdom, David's kingdom. Um, see under David there, there's, there's, uh, goes all the way up to the river Euphrates at the top. And then if you look down there at the Gulf of Aqaba, uh, if you go um, a little bit north from the Gulf of Aqaba, there's a, a, a wadi there, um, which is called the river, which would be called the River of Egypt. It's not the Nile that we're talking about here. It doesn't go all the way to the Nile, but it does go to the, the wadi um, that is uh, to the north of the Gulf of Aqaba there. That, that would be um, known as, as the River of Egypt. 
Um, so so what, what is placed in the mouth of Abraham exactly maps what happens uh, under the period of the monarchy. So next slide. So some more examples. Um, the emphasis on Judah in the stories of Jacob and Joseph. Um, so, so later in the book of Genesis, there's a story of, of uh, there's Abraham, then his son Isaac, um, and then uh, Jacob and Esau. And then Jacob, um, when he becomes an old man, um, he blesses his son uh, Judah. He blesses all of his sons, right, before he dies. Uh, but, but there's a special emphasis on the son Judah. Um, and one of the things he says is that the scepter shall not pass from Judah, nor the mace from between his legs, that tribute to him may come, and to him the submission of peoples. So in the mouth of the great patriarch um, comes forth this word that Judah, out of Judah will come the kings that will reign over God's people. Well, um, you can see there uh, that after Solomon, the kingdom divides in two, and, and that kingdom is called Judah, and then the northern kingdom is called Israel. Um, but uh, thus, uh, thus the monarchy is God-ordained, and it resides in the tribe of Judah, as foretold by the patriarch Jacob. Now think back to um, Aeneas, right? And Aeneas's father um, predicting the descendants of, uh, that are going to rule Rome. Uh, and it just happens to be that he's predicting <laughs> Caesar Augustus, right? So, so it's a similar kind of thing going on. And also remember that David is a Judahite. Saul is of the tribe of Benjamin. So it's not only, so, so the, the, the important household here, the important tribe is not Benjamin, Saul, it's Judah. Uh, and so, so isn't it convenient that, that uh, Father Jacob says, uh, Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Um, and then David uh, is the youngest son of Jesse, anointed as king above all his brothers. Um, if we, look, we can find that in 1 Samuel 16. Um, and then Samuel, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Solomon, one of David's youngest sons, supplants his older brother Adonijah. We can see that in uh, 1 Kings chapter 1 and 2. And the theme of younger sons uh, uh, ruling over older brothers uh, appears throughout Genesis, right? Jacob and Esau. Jacob is younger. Um, Esau is the older. And uh, um, Jacob gets that position of being uh, greater than his older brother through stealth, right? And through a mother that connives to make it happen. And what happens in the period of the kings? Who's Solomon's mother? Anybody remember Bathsheba? And Bathsheba uh, goes to David and says, oh, you know, um, who's picking the king of Israel? <laughs> Aren't you the king of Israel? Uh, last I checked, you were the king of Israel. But, um, you know, your, your son Adonijah, is already having a, uh, a inauguration party saying that he's the king and he's gonna get anointed king. So David says, oh no, no, that's not gonna happen. I'm gonna choose the king. And, and um, Bathsheba says, well, you promised it to my son Solomon, you know, All right? So, so that's when um, Zadok the priest uh, anoints um, Solomon as king and then uh, Solomon, uh, by the way, has brother Adonijah uh, put out of the way. Um, so, uh, so the theme of the younger sons over older brothers throughout Genesis, Jacob and Esau, Judah above his older brothers. Judah is not the, the, the firstborn of, of uh, Jacob either. He's like the third in line, I think it is. Um, and then the theme uh, of, or, or I'm sorry, then uh, of course there's Joseph, right? That rules all his brothers at the end of Genesis, right? He's, he's really the, the one that everybody thinks is gonna die. They try to kill him, but he comes out to be the ruler on top. He's, he's second only to Pharaoh in Egypt. Um, and then, uh, then uh, fraternal jealousy 
and fighting even the murder or attempted murder also appears in Genesis. Cain and Abel, as we've talked about, right? Um, rivalry between Jacob and Esau. Esau wants to kill Jacob. That's why he, uh, his, his mother gets him out of town. Um, so that he doesn't get killed by his brother Esau, who's really upset that he stole the birthright from him. Um, and then, of course, uh, Joseph, um, they leave him for dead. Uh, the brothers throw him into a pit. Uh, they take the uh, uh, embroidered coat um, and uh, put blood on it so that uh, they, they bring it back to their father saying, your son is dead. Uh, but he actually, he isn't. Uh, we, we know in the story that he gets picked up by some Midianite traders and they take him down to Egypt and sell him into slavery. Um, interestingly, just, just, this is just a little, there's a, there's a phrase for what we call that coat of many colors that we often talk about of Joseph, but it really means like an embroidered robe. Um, it's a very particular name for a garment and it appears only one other place in the Old Testament, you know where that is. It's um, when Tamar is raped, the garment that she has um, that has been ripped from her by her brother Ammon when she, when, after she has been raped um, is the very same words that is used about Joseph and the, that coat of many colors that we call it, but it's mis mistranslation. So, so isn't that an interesting link as well to why, why that phrase appears only in those two places, right? That, that very particular word. Um, but we could go on and on about also about the word Tamar uh, in, in the Old Testament and Tamar um, in, in Samuel, but we've already talked about this a little bit uh, when, when uh, Professor Stussy mentioned this a little bit in her lecture. So we won't go into that today, but um, uh, so uh, this, this uh, fraternal jealousy and murder calls to mind Absalom, David's son Absalom, murders his brother Ammon, um, and Solomon has an Adonijah murder. So, so there, that's, that's part of that tradition, right? And so, so if you bring that back to the Cain and Abel story, there's perhaps also not only an endorsement of the monarchy, but a critique of how these king's sons we're behaving um, as well. So we can go on to the next slide now. So we're going to leave Genesis unless so does anybody have any questions about the Genesis connections here uh, before we move on. Does that all make sense to folks? I mean, is that question? Father Mark, this is Martha Watson. Yes, Martha, good to see you. We didn't see you there. There you are, Martha, way yeah. up there. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment as you're talking. Sure. You know, a Regarding, can you hear me? Oh, regarding um, the fraternal side or the conflicts between siblings. Uh huh. Because I think a lot of mythology is around those issues about yeah. how societies are developed. How do you um, reconcile relationships and power? Yes. Yeah. I think that's, those are very clear. Themes. I think they even exist in our society on some level. So I think yeah. one of the ways they exist is that people even, I, let me speak for myself. I can say something and present it as my reality and my sister and I can talk and she can present the same situation from another reality. Uh -huh. And I think that's how families develop their traditions and their realities that sometimes might be really off base. Because mm -hmm. we, we, we build on fantasies at times, and we let these fantasies yes. become reality. Yes. Well, I, I have that same experience or similar experience in, in my family. My brother, I, I'll remember something, um, and my brother has no clue what I'm talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. <laughs> and and, I'm and saying to me, it's that, a really important memory, right? Right. But also, <laughs> in terms of the history that one reality will dominate the other and become justification for a way of living. Yes, which is kind of what we're talking about here, right? Um, in, in the biblical account, 
But but I think you know to your point, Martha, um, that these things had a, had a very particular maybe reason for being developed and written and and woven together in their own time um, on a on a meta level. Mm -hmm. But uh, the power of the text is that they can um, uh, evoke these other things in us as well. I mean, about like, how we relate as siblings, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and they can and they can sort of um, allow that inner thing to emerge within us psychologically um, for us to be able to articulate it. And, and it's the story that, that um, unlocks that for us. So maybe yeah. the Holy Spirit is at work in all of these ways within, within a text like this. I, I think so. And I think also the Holy Spirit is asking us to critique it. Yes. And to, you know, what, you know, was this really what God would want us to do? Yes. Why yeah. would we think we have to murder our siblings or right. other people when I say siblings <laughs> in the world? Indeed. I thought of it. I think we, you had a question though, right? Oh, um, yeah, it, I was thinking of those ladies um, putting their sons into power and um, in the Ottoman Empire, which of course was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years later, um, the Sultan, um, the wife of the Sultan was no big deal, but the mother of the Sultan, that was an official title and she was a very important and powerful person. Oh. So I can understand why, I guess, why those ladies were, those women were trying to put their sons on the throne. Right. They expected to be pretty powerful as well. Right, exactly. And, and that's, uh, if you recall, um, I think it was Professor Stussy might have been raising this issue that um, there, there's a whole um, series of wives, not just one wife, right? And, and they're all vying for their sons to become king because as you say, that becomes a pretty powerful position. And so you're right, yeah. So that's why um, that Sheba is the one who, who is trying to uh, position her son to become the king and it works, he's, you know, Solomon, yeah. I was thinking when uh, Martha was talking that Again, could you? I'm sorry, I'm not. I, haven't heard I was thinking when Martha was talking about the sibling rivalry aspect of that, that that whole thing is an out, an outcome of the original fall. I mean, Cain killing Abel, and it's it's the fruit of the fallen state, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's it's interesting because in the Bible, when you see this, like with Joseph and his brothers, he had forgiveness. And he was able to help him, the brothers and the family and, and, and all of that. But it doesn't always work out like that because with David and his brother, or well, Solomon and his brothers, it's a totally different thing. David just kind of, I mean, Solomon just kind of takes care of business and gets rid of him. But it's, it's interesting to see how that dynamic doesn't seem to be adjusted. And then in the New Testament, Judas isn't a brother, but he's a brother in spirit, so kind of. And then you have that betrayal taking place again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to the next uh, example here, right, uh, of, of the shadow of David. Now, it's not uncommon for us to want to talk about Psalms outside of, the, of, of uh, Samuel, because that's the next biggest place where David seems to be um, uh, casting his shadow. Uh, the Psalms are shot through with the shadow of David. There are fully 73 of the 150 Psalms that um, either are attributed to David or, 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 or have an, uh, a superscript that says of David, right? Or mention David within the context of the, of the Psalm itself. Uh, but David probably wrote none or very few um, <laughs> himself, right? Um, uh, rather later community honored uh, what, it, what is called the sweet singer of Israel to Samuel 23. He's, he's referred to that um, with Psalms of, or better in honor of. So if we see that superscript in the Psalm saying a Psalm of David, it's probably better understood as a Psalm in honor of David. Uh, not necessarily that, that, that David wrote that Psalm. We're going to look at an example of that um, as, as we go ahead. Um, so many are associated with stories about David, like Psalm 3, 
And Psalm 3 um, is a psalm of David when he fled from his son, Absalom. Now, if we, if we look at 2 Samuel 15, we find out that, um, did, did I mess up my, no, there we go. Okay. Um, if we remember the story, right? Um, this, is, this is, I think, to, to somebody's point, uh, maybe it was yours, Felicia, that, that like these, these uh, actions have repercussions, right? So um, what we, we have it, 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 right after the story of um, the, the, the violation of Bathsheba by David, and, and they're having a son and the son dies, uh, right after that is the story of um, Amnon desiring his sister Tamar um, and uh, making situations such that, that puts her in a compromising situation and he rapes his sister Tamar, his half-sister. Um, David does not um, seem to respond to that situation in an appropriate way. Um, he doesn't uh, get, you know, uh, get rid of Amnon or, or do something to punish him. He seems to let, let it, just let it go. And her brother Absalom, however, um, becomes um, enraged at the, that, he, that this justice is being, injustice is being done. And so as, as the, the, the story develops, um, Absalom kills his brother Amnon and then starts a revolution to David. And so, uh, and the revolution begins to gain steam. And so David needs to flee Jerusalem. And we see that in chapter 15. If you want to go look at 2 Samuel 15, you'll find that out. You can read the story for yourself. But uh, Psalm 3, the superscription is a Psalm of David as he is fleeing um, his son Absalom. And it's a story all about um, when, when it seems like everything is going wrong and, and you're, you're losing, um, that, that the psalmist raises his trust uh, in God. Um, so I would recommend that you read Psalm 3 at some point. Uh, we don't have time to read it today, but it's, a, but it's a wonderful psalm. And in fact, in the Benedictine tradition, um, in the office of Matins, which is the pre-dawn office, um, Psalm 3 is read every day as the very first thing um, that, that is, is prayed in the daily office in um, the Benedictine tradition, Psalm 3. Um, and uh, but that, that's, that's just a little factoid, right? <laughs> that really doesn't have anything to do with, with what we're talking about today. Um, and uh, uh, so that's one example. Psalm 3 is an example uh, which, of, of a psalm that, that's supposed to evoke um, a situation in the life of David, but not just that, it, it, that, that situation that then, then, then we're in, as the audience or the, or the people praying these texts are invited to use this psalm. But when have we been in a situation where we feel like we were being betrayed or, or, or everybody had left us alone and, and, and we had no help but in God? Uh, we had no place else to turn. Um, so that's what Psalm 3 is inviting all of us to do. So, so the, the story is to, ref, the, the psalm gives us a, a time to reflect on a, another story in the Bible, but gives us a context in which to pray through that story. So that gets a little bit more to um, Mother Lynn's territory of things here, uh, which we'll, we'll be talking about in a few weeks. Uh, but but um, so, so that's Psalm 3. But Psalm 89 probably dates much after David um, and to the period um, of the exile. And let's take a look at some of the verses of Psalm 89, um, because it's all about God's promises to David. Um, and if we looked at the, the um, towards the beginning of the Psalm, uh, verses three and four, um, the psalmist actually makes sort of a, a uh, claim against God. You know, remember the Psalms, the Psalms are wonderful because they tell it like it is. They, they, they say, you know, they, they complain to God sometimes, you know, where are you? You know, you, 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 you said you would always be here and you're, you're not, or at least I don't feel it. You know, 
Um, that's kind of what's going on here in this, uh, this psalm. Verse 3, you said to God, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. And then it's a very long psalm, so we're going to skip down to verse um, 19. Um, then you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David with my holy oil. I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. And then further on towards the end of the psalm, you could read the whole psalm when you have a chance. And this, is, this was actually the psalm in the liturgy today, portions of Psalm 89. Um, again, the psalmist complaining to God. Moreover, you have turned back the edge of his sword and you have not supported him in battle. You have removed the scepter from his hand and hurled his throne to the ground. You have cut short the days of his youth and covered him with shame. Now, a few verses earlier, I should have started a few verses earlier. Um, you have broken through the city walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him. He has become the scorn of his neighbors and have exalted the right hand of his foes. So this is a reference to the exile. So remember, God promises, right, that um, he will remember David. He has made an everlasting covenant with David. And yet the people find themselves in the, in the situation in which the entire city is destroyed. They're thrown away into Babylon in exile. And so what's up with this, right? How can you do this, God? You said, remember that that's, I mean, that's such a powerful phrase, right? You said, I will make an everlasting covenant with David. Well, sure, it doesn't look like it now, right? So what Israel has to do in this new context is to reimagine what must it be that God is talking about here, but that, that we, we will not, we will refuse to believe that God lied to us or that there is no God. We refuse to believe that. Our faith is has to be that God's promise is somehow going to be revealed in some other way. And so they have to reimagine that covenant with David. And that's where the messianic expectation continues to happen in Israel, looking forward to a Messiah, the anointed one, the king. Um, and so does the Christian tradition. We have to, we, we rethink it also in, 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 in a different way. So that brings us, of course, to the New Testament, and to uh, segue into the Gospel of Matthew, if we want to turn on to the next uh, slide here. So this is the very first uh, verse of Matthew's Gospel. In part, says Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, right at the very beginning of the, of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, more than any Gospel, highlights the title of Jesus as the son of David 37 times. You can remember those two things. 73 Psalms named after David, 37 times in the Gospel of Matthew that uh, he, he uses the term son of David. Um, so David casts his shadow even on the title Messiah, which means anointed one. And of course, we know that, uh, that David's anointed three different times in, in, uh, in, in Samuel, right? First of all, uh, by, uh, uh, by Samuel, when he's tending his father's sheep, then a second time, but then finally, the most important time uh, in, in his inauguration as king in Jerusalem, uh, that was the gospel or the, the first reading a few weeks back, um, where the, the, the covenant with David as eternal is uh, ratified uh, and David is anointed as king. So that very word, um, Messiah, means anointed one, right? Or king, right? So uh, so that to say that Jesus is Messiah is to say that Jesus is king. Um, 
not you know in the, in the line of David. And uh, it also we have the word, word the Greek word Christos from which we get Christ. So um, Christ is not Jesus' last name as we all know, um, but rather it's um, it's a title, which means the Anointed One or the King or the Messiah. Um, and interestingly, when what's the old word for baptizing our babies? Christening, right? Ah, christening. So we have a, a christing, christing, anointing, anointing with water and with oil, right? Um, uh, so when we are baptized, we even have David's name in, in, in all of our, uh, uh, because we become also the anointed, sharing in the kingship of Christ, sharing in the messiahood of Christ. We become like little Christs um, when we're baptized, right? So, 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 the shadow of David is even even there, right? Um, when we when we are christened, um, the New Testament, especially Matthew, sees the coming of Jesus as the fulfillment of the covenant with David. And so, like David before him, Jesus has ancient and royal lineage, right? So, if we looked at the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, um, which we can look at very very briefly here. Um, In a second to just look at this. Um, there's a it, there's a whole uh, genealogy of David. I'm sorry, of Jesus in there, uh, and it it hinges on David. It um, it starts it starts out with Abraham, who is sort of the the big deal, right? The father of Abraham is the father of all of of the people of Israel, and and. As Christians, we believe our father as well. Read the book of Romans if you want to know more about that. Um, but, then, but then David, it becomes the, the next key, right? Um, and, then, uh, and then the next, the next uh, sort of crucial moment in Israel's history that, that, that is talked about here is the Babylonian exile. And then, the Babyl and then from the Babylonian exile to the time of Jesus. So, then, uh, so there's all these, you know, so-and-so is the father of so-and-so is the father of so-and-so. Uh, we have a whole genealogy here, and in, in, in the old King James, it's the word begat, right? The begats, so and so begat, so and so begat, so and so, um, and so uh, all the generations from Abraham to David are fourteen generations, uh, and from David to the deportation of Babylon, fourteen generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, fourteen generations. Well, actually, if you did <laughs> you did the math, it doesn't really work that way. But 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 it works literally, literarily, right? Um, uh, because if you if you look at there's like some big gaps here, um, which we won't go into. For example, uh, uh, I can't resist. Um, uh, where are we here? Okay. Um, Salmon was the uh, the father of Boaz by Rahab and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. So Rahab um, is, remember she appears, it, it, it's interesting that there's only a few women in the list and they're famous women. And, and Rahab or Rahab um, is the one who, uh, is, she's a Gentile. All the women that are mentioned by the way are not Jews, they're Gentiles. Um, and uh, she's the one that lets down the, uh, to say, yeah, yeah, to let down the guys out so they could go. And so she's re, and she uh, uh, in Jericho. And so she's the one who actually um, saves the, the spies that Joshua sends out. Um, and so we find out that she's in the line here. Um, and then Ruth, who is a, a Moabite, right? So she's also a Gentile. She's mentioned. So, um, so, so the, the, the women that are mentioned uh, in particular are Gentiles. Um, and uh, so, so there's that. So, um, so, but the point here being that um, the first chapter of Matthew lays out this lineage and a genealogy to show where Jesus comes from. Again, not dissimilar to what went on in the Aeneid or what went on in the book of Genesis to try to demonstrate that, that this person has, uh, is part uh, they're, they're no, they're no upstart. They come from a long line of, 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 of people who they ought to. So, so 
they have legitimacy, right? Yeah. Rahab, where was she originally from? I mean, she's not part of the tribe of Israel, but where was she from? Rahab? Yeah. Yeah. She was a Canaanite. She's from Jericho, right? Because uh, remember, she's in the city. She lives in the city wall. And Modern day. By the way. Modern day. What country is that? See. Modern day. In today's oh, time, oh. what country is that? It would be Israel. It would still remember, be Israel. Because remember what happens is that the people are in the desert mm -hmm. in, in that part of the story, right? Um, and Joshua uh, brings them across the Jordan River into um, the land of Canaan, the land of promise, right? Mm -hmm. um, so she's one of the folks that are already living there, um, one of the Canaanites. And Jericho is, is uh, not far from Jerusalem. Remember, uh, Jericho is really close to Jerusalem because in the Gospel of Mark, um, remember uh, the, the man born blind comes to Jesus and says, you know, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's healed by Jesus, right? Uh, and that's just literally the story before the entry into Jerusalem. So, so it's close to, uh, Jericho is close to Jerusalem. Okay. So yeah, it's, 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 yeah, but, but she's, she's not, um, a native born Israelite. She's a Gentile woman, right? Yeah. The reason I ask is because I recently worked with a woman whose name was Rahab. Oh. And she was from Syria though. So uh -huh. I was okay. trying to figure out uh -huh. where that, yeah. she may, where she may have come from. My guess is probably a lot of the names of that region are, are regional names, right? So it would make sense. Sure. Mm -hmm. Or maybe she's named after her. <laughs> Could be. Um, so, uh, so that's the, the uh, genealogy. That's an important thing we want to just raise up. And again, we're doing a little um, uh, quick tour through all of this. Uh, and uh, we, we could spend time on any one of these things. But uh, if you want to know more about the genealogy, all you have to do is read the first chapter of, of, uh, of Matthew. And you find some interesting things that show up in that. Um, and like David, he is anointed in his baptism, uh, and he redefines kinship, kingship. So, um, you know, Jesus isn't anointed with oil at his baptism, but he is anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he is anointed with water um, uh, in his baptism. Uh, and he comes out of the water, and he has the divine imprimatur saying, this is my son, um, in whom... I am well pleased, right? So, so like David, Jesus has a spiritual anointing uh, for his kingship. But as we find out in the Gospels, he redefines what that means. It's not, he's not a warrior per se, um, but uh, uh, he is a warrior in that he defeats all the principalities and powers of darkness that seek to destroy the creatures of God. Um, in his death and in his resurrection. So he becomes a great warrior uh, in, in a spiritual sense. Um, so uh, then that brings us to another one of the Psalms, Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is used uh, a lot in the New Testament and in the Christian tradition. Um, and If we went to Psalm 10, well, actually, we, we won't go to Psalm 10. We're going we're gonna to see how it's quoted um, in the Gospel of Matthew. But before we go to how it's quoted in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 22, we're going to go a little bit into chapter 21 of the Gospel of Matthew, which is the triumphal entry uh, where Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem, the city of David, right? So he comes to the city of David as the new king. The, the successor, as it were, of David. Um, and when, when they come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage and the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village and immediately they'll find a donkey tied to a colt. Um, untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them. And he sat on them 
A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest heaven. So Jesus has just entered the city and the city of David and is being hailed as basically the descendant of David, the son of David, um, in, the, in the same line as David. Uh, he's going to be like David, in other words. And then when we get to 22, this is our, he, he's already in, in Jerusalem. It's the, it's, it's, we're beginning that process towards Holy Week, um, or in, in Holy Week, in the last week of Jesus' life. And he's, he's having all of these confrontations and questions by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, and then uh, at 2241, um, he says this, he has this, he's, he's entering into a, a Pharisaic dialogue with the Pharisees. Um, now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Um, whose son is he? And then they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then, this is in, he quotes Psalm 110, that David by the spirit calls him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. That doesn't sound good. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Now, no one was able to give him an answer. Not from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. By the way, those of you who are, are in the, uh, uh, not in the studio audience, um, it just sounded like there's something like an accident outside. So that's, that's why we said it doesn't sound good. So just so that you know what we we're talking about. And a couple of folks are going out to check on it, by the way, in case you're interested in that. Um, so he, he quotes the first verse of Psalm 110, which is, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Now, of course, in its context, um, the, the Lord is Yahweh, the God of Israel, in the temple, right? And so this is a coronation psalm. And so the Lord says to my Lord, says to the king, sit at your right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, interestingly, um, if this is a, a psalm that dates to, say, the time of Solomon, the, the, the Temple of Solomon is in one place, and, and right next to the Temple of Solomon is the Palace of Solomon. So the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right, right? Okay, that, that, that here's, here I am, the king of the God, and you are the king, and you're sitting next to me, right? So, so in its context, that's, that's probably, it's a royal psalm, it's probably meant for a coronation or 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 to talk about the royalty. Uh, but uh, in this context, Jesus turns the tables. He's redefining what it means, right? So um, he's saying, uh, if David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? So, so that means that he's greater than, than uh, David, this, this son of David. Um, and so, so Jesus is really telegraphing here his true identity as the Lord of David. He is greater than David, as the, as the hymn says, great David's greater son, right? Um, so that's, that's, um, that is what, what we're hearing in this gospel. Just as Jesus enters, see the trajectory here, right? So he enters the city of Jerusalem in triumph. He's called David's son. He enters the city of David. He goes into the temple, and in the temple, he, in the Pharisees, he's saying, um, the Lord said to my Lord, uh, sit on my right until I make your enemies your footstool. Um, and what's he just about going to do when he goes uh, to his passion and to his death? He's going to make his enemies his footstool. He's going to conquer the powers of, of, of death and hell and the principalities and powers of darkness on the hill of Calvary and in his resurrection. So, this is all being telegraphed for us. So how does the Christian tradition answer the problem of Psalm 89? You said, my covenant will be forever. That's right. 
And the, what we say is the covenant is forever because David's greater son has fought the battle. He has been our um, champion against Goliath and, and has killed Goliath on our behalf. Um, and so David's greater son has actually entered the city of David, gone into the temple, um, and in his own body on the cross becomes the temple and the sacrifice and the king um, in his death and in his resurrection. So um, that's the New Testament's answer to, uh, uh, to David. And, and David's shadow, though, is cast all the way through that. That's the language that we use. Um, to discuss all of that in our, in our own biblical theology. So uh, I think that's the last slide, is it not? Let's go to the last slide. Yes, there we go. In the shadow of David, we're back to where we began. Um, uh, reading beyond Samuel. So, so the, let's think about the history just a second to close. Um, and then we can go to a couple other final questions if you have it. That... Um, there's great hopes for Saul, right? And those hopes are dashed. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he isn't the king he was supposed to be. David comes to the throne. Great hope for David too, right? Um, but um, as we, we found out in the story of, uh, of, of uh, Bathsheba, the whole reason why he messes up is because if you read the first verses of that chapter, in the spring of the year, when kings go out to war, What's he doing? <laughs> He's lazing in his couch, right? <laughs> and he happens to see this beautiful woman bathing on the, on the rooftop next to him. Um, so he should have been being the king. And he wasn't being the king. He was letting somebody else do the dirty work. And he was lazing in his palace, right? Uh, and then there's a whole trajectory of his downfall from that moment on. Um, and then his son Solomon. Great hopes for his son Solomon. Uh, he extends the, you know, the, the great kingdom. He, he, um, he, he uh, builds the temple. Um, but then we find out in, in his old age, he also uh, uh, disobeys the Lord and, 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 and falls from where he's supposed to be. And then in one generation, his son, there's a great uh, civil war. And so the whole thing that they had joined for, for just a short period of time, Camelot, I guess you could call it, um, was shut, uh, rendered in two, and there's the south and the north, and they become two different kingdoms. Um, the the uh, lost tribes, as we often call them, in the kingdom of Israel in the north, and Judah in the south, which then becomes the only um, remnant that's that's left after the Babylonian captivity. The north, after it's destroyed by the Syri Assyrians, never comes back again. We never know whatever happened to any of those folks again uh, in the northern kingdom with Samaria being their capital. Two temples, one in the, the bottom of this of, of that, that kingdom and one in, the, in the, the north, only one temple in Jerusalem. But when the Syrians come in and destroy the northern uh, uh, kingdom, never seen again as a, as, a, as a political entity. Only Judah remains. There's the exile uh, in 586. They come back about 40 years later, are able to rebuild the temple under the Persians, uh, and, and, and that kingdom is restored. But it's never what it was supposed to be. That's why there's a sense of, of you know, what's going to happen? Where are you? What, what's, how, you? You told us that this is going to be an everlasting covenant. So they, try, they have begin to think of, this is, this is where the whole idea of messianic hope comes in. And then, then again, we as Christians reinterpret that, reinvest that tradition again um, uh, in the person of Jesus. It's, it's interesting because it goes right back to what God said in the very beginning when he tells them, you really don't want a king. <laughs> you know, he said, this is not what you ought to have. But then they protest and he says, go ahead and give them what they want. Mm -hmm. And that was the outcome of that. It, it, it amazes me. I mean, I, I realized there was problems with the whole 
tribal system that caused them to think that that's what they needed. But it's, it's, it's a real teaching point. When God tells you you don't want something, you really don't want something. <laughs> Well, that's that's right. I mean, that that's the the whole thing about the, the 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 genius and the wisdom of the Torah, especially you know Genesis, and especially that first that that story in chapter two and chapter in chapter three um, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Um, which then becomes a prototype for humanity from then on, right? I mean, uh, you know, when we think about original sin, we think of it as just something that, that David did that we all sort of are guilty because of that, right? No, we all make, our, we, we all make the same decision, right? That's, that's, the, that's the point of it, that, that all of us uh, do the same thing. We all, we all um, make a choice against God in our lives. Uh, at, at various points, not always, but 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 our but the trajectory of human nature. Read Romans seven; uh, it tells us exactly that. That uh, what Paul says is the good that I would love to do, I don't do, <laughs> and the and the the uh, the bad stuff that I don't want to do, that's what I wind up doing. Um, oh wretched man that I am, who will um, save me from the bottom from that from 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 this death? You know, and then he goes on. Chapter eight, thanks be to God who has given us the victory in Christ Jesus. Um, so so that, that's sort of like the human condition is, is talked about in that wonderful story in Genesis chapter three. And you can see it in the Bathsheba story. David desires the fruit. He could have anything he wanted, <laughs> uh, but he picks the fruit of that tree, right? Um, and, and Nathan says that to him. You know, uh, that after this happens, Nathan, the prophet, goes to him and said, there was a man who uh, had nothing but this one little ewe sheep. And um, the rich man comes to him and says, I want that for my, my guests. And he takes it from him and he kills it and serves it to his guest. And, and David says, um, who is that person? We're going we're gonna to give him justice. And Nathan then in that famous turn points his finger at him you can just see it the story is so real you are the man right um so so it's the same theme again and again throughout throughout the scripture it, it, it um how we we um turn the tables we we think that we can do it all on our own and that it's all about us right uh, and we can have whatever we want um and and get all we want and acquire all we want um, and we have and there's no boundaries right um, but actually there is uh, and and that's that's the real world right uh, and that's the wisdom of the bible any other thoughts questions comments before we end yeah jim and then i'll when take some new folks over here too when you speak of um the trajectory of the human spirit, and you we're looking at David's storyline, David um, gender identifying as male, and you know we know that he has a very strong relationship with Jonathan as well. But when we look at women today, I was just wondering, do we then refer back to the trajectory of women in the Bible mm. to see what their trajectory is? Mm -hmm. That's a very good point, right? Um, We've seen, now I'm not sure um, exactly what your question is in that regard, but I think that it, it's, okay, we have to just determine, first of all, and just, just name the fact that what we're dealing with is primarily a patriarchal text, right? So let, let's just like call it what it is, right? <laughs> uh, at the same time, there are strong women and their stories that appear. Um, and one of them is, is the story of that Sheba. And as, as um, Professor Alter, um, talked about, um, yes, at the beginning of the story, um, she is the object of sexual violence. But at the same time, then she tries to protect herself and her children by um, playing by the rules, those rules, right? Those same rules. And, and, and so the question is, can you play by those same rules and, and actually win uh, or, or, or not, right? Um, 
but but there's lots of stories in Genesis, for example, right? Of of uh, of <coughs> the story of Rebecca and the story of Sarah, and and the 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 story of 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 also of um, oh my gosh. Um, no, well, well, Ruth's a good story too, um, but um, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm forgetting uh, Abraham's uh, Hagar. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was having one of those senior moments. Um, um, yeah, Hagar, right? I mean, what about Hagar? Uh, and she's definitely maltreated by Sarah of all people, right? I mean, in fact, if you look at the text. Uh, uh, Abraham seems to be much more um, forgiving of, of, of Hagar and, and not wanting to get rid of Hagar and, and you know, Ishmael, who he really likes, right? Uh, and if you look at the story, he, he kind of, he really thinks he's really pretty good guy, right? Uh, and yet um, Sarah's son is Isaac, who turns out to be like a, a total dolt in the story. I mean, it's almost humorous sometimes, like about what, like how incapable he is, uh, and and um, everything has to be done for him, right? Um, he's sort of the the way you get to Jacob <laughs> uh, in in the stories. Isaac is like it's really not, you know. So so yeah. So I mean, there's lots of stories in which women um, play an important role. Um, and so the question, though, is I, I don't. Th I think that the Bible is 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 wise enough not to simply valorize those women, right? So so um, they also are capable of of not great stuff as well, um, but they also are the object of oppression. And and what's interesting, I think, also is that the Bible doesn't shy away from that, right? Um, in if if you look at the Samuel stories. Um, you know, we are clearly shown how badly that Sheba has been treated, right? Um, and, uh, and, and as Professor Susti said a couple of weeks ago, Michal, right? Uh, Saul's daughter who becomes his wife, and then she marries somebody else. And maybe they both were wildly in love with each other because it sure seems like her, her husband um, uh, was really in love with her because he follows along as she's being taken away from him, right? And, and then he's given back to David again. Um, so, um, so yes, I mean, that there's lots of, of powerful women and, and unempowered women um, in the scriptures, but uh, women who are, are um, um, the objects of, of abuse. Also, but but what's interesting is that the sto the Bible doesn't shy away in some ways from from those stories. Um, again, recalling that what what this is is in large part um, a patriarchal narrative that we have to somehow like deal with that, right? Um, uh, so uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm not sure if that answers your question, Jim, but but. Uh, it just brings up one more question, which is, uh, I wonder if the Bible, if it were ever written in um, a matriarchal point of view, what that would sound like. I mean, uh -huh, uh -huh. That, that's yeah, yeah. more of a rhetorical question, yeah. but. I mean, I think that there, I mean, I can't, I, I know I have heard of some um, historical fiction that, that comes at it from that way. I, I can't give you exact titles. I know that I, I know that books like that exist. I don't know how good they are, <laughs> uh, but but uh, like say, what what if we told this story from the point of say Tamar, or uh, if we told the story from the point of Hagar, for example, right? Um, what would it look like then? Yeah. Um, or Eve, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. What, what would the story look like if Eve Eve told the story? Um, right. So, so, but what, listen to what we're doing here now though, right? Um, it, it, it's, we're engaging the tech, the text has power, right? And we, we're engaging it in that sort of way that that's what, that's what, um, uh, the rabbis and, and the Jewish tradition has always done. They, they've, they've told stories about stories, right? Uh, uh, about the Bible. Uh, that's kind of what the Talmud is in some ways, right? It's, uh, um, 
that, that what, what, like sort of the what ifs they sometimes ask, right? Or, or uh, if, if that was the case, then, then what? What would it look like, right? So, so, um, so you, you can talk, you can have lots of um, stories and imaginings that go beyond the text. Uh, Yes, and you can have friendly arguments as well, right? That as as you know, um, uh, Aaron last week was telling us and, and pointing out, reminding us that the Bible doesn't have a, a, a univocal narrative, right? It's it's uh, all the different stuff is in there, right? Um, and because the editor was humble enough to to not make a choice, you know, who am I to make a choice, right? Uh, uh, so yeah. Father Mark, uh, this is, oh, this yeah, go is ahead, Martha. Martha. I'm yes, going to have to leave because I, I have a family meeting, but what I want to say, can we continue this discussion next week? Because I think uh, it's very powerful. Well, next next week we have our, our uh, friend uh, Stephen McKenzie with us. Oh, that's right. But, that's but, right. But, no, but that's okay. You can, you can raise up some of these questions, see what he has to say. Yeah, He's the because, expert on David. <laughs> uh, no, because I think it's wonderful, and I, I want to continue, but I have to go. That's all I'm saying. But we we all I, have to go because me. it's almost noon. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. So, so, that, that, so we'll come to our end. Thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you all who are in, from our Facebook audience, our Zoom audience. Glad to see you all. And uh, next week. We have our friend uh, Stephen McKenzie, author of David, a biography from Oxford University Press. Um, see you all then. Okay. Okay. Bye, bye everybody. Have a good bye, week. Abby. Bye, Thank bye. you. Have bye, everyone. Bye-bye.